And we're live. So hello, everybody. Thanks for joining me today. Um, so I'm Sarah Provado, and I'll be your host for today on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And for those of you that don't know, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants is all about bringing science, adventure, and conservation to classrooms across North America. Um, and today we have seven classrooms across North America joining us, and I will give everybody a chance to say hello. So we'll start with Miss Hans's class from Texas. Um, thanks for joining us today. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so I feel like there's a couple more people joining in. Hi, guys. And then we have Miss Lackey's class coming in from New Jersey here. Hi. Hey, guys. And then we have Miss Michael's class. Where are you guys? Miss Michael's class coming in somewhere there. There, there's the, everyone's waving there. Hey, everybody. Here, let me unmute your mic. Hi, guys. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. <laughs> as well as we have Miss Diane Hans's class coming in. <laughs> Hard finding everybody here. Um, and then we have Miss Coe's class from Waterloo, which is not too far from where I am right now. <laughs> Hello. Can you everybody. hear me? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Awesome. I'm just going to continue muting those mics. Hi. <laughs> Hi. We and then we have Miss you. you can't hear me? Connection. Okay, so hi, Miss uh, Vanderzee's class. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs> awesome. All right. So um, last month we dedicated our hangouts to showcasing scientists and advocates um, dedicated to ocean plastic pollution. And for the month of October, we are continuing our hangouts with ocean scientists and explorers from many different fields, from filmography to coral reef explorers. And on today's Exploring by the Cedar Pants Hangout, it is my pleasure to introduce Julia Barnes to everybody here today. And for those of you who may not know, um, Julia Barnes is an award-winning filmmaker um, behind the sea of life. And for as long as she can remember, Julia has been passionate about the natural world. And after watching Rob Stewart's documentary Revolution and learning about the world's coral reefs, rainforest, fisheries and that they're expected to be wiped out um, by the middle of the century, she was compelled to take ant action. And uh, film is the most powerful weapon she could imagine. So she picked up a video camera and set out to make a documentary to raise awareness about the biggest threats facing the ocean and inspire audiences to turn things around. So thanks for joining us today, Julia, and I will let Julia take over and then we can go to each classroom to take questions. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me and thanks everyone for joining and listening to my presentation today. I'm going to start by sharing my slideshow. Okay, awesome. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to tell you guys a story about how I became fascinated by coral reefs and why I'm on a quest to save them. When I was 16, oh, Let's make sure I can advance the next slide. Okay, there we go. When I was 16, I watched a documentary called Revolution by Rob Stewart. And in that movie, I was learning for the first time that all the world's rainforests, fish, and coral reef are predicted to be wiped out by the middle of the century. As a kid, I had always been in love with nature, so yes. when I found this out, um, I couldn't believe I hadn't known this was happening, and I wanted to do everything I could to turn things around. So I decided to make a movie to show people what's happening in the ocean. And about a week after watching Revolution, I got a camera, signed up for a scuba diving course, and set out to make a little film called Sea of Life. Coral reefs ended up being the main focus of the movie. They're one of the most amazing, unique organisms on the planet, and they're also one of the most threatened. Coral reefs are really important because they tell us what's happening on our planet. When corals aren't happy, that's kind of a sign that something is very wrong in the ocean. 
our planet has been through five mass extinctions in the last 500 million years. And through all of these extinctions, coral reefs have been the first to go down. So the fact that we're losing corals right now tells us that we're bringing on a mass extinction in the oceans with the potential to wipe out a significant chunk of life on Earth. So it's really important to understand what's going on with coral reefs and to figure out how we're going to turn things around. Corals play a significant role in maintaining life in the ocean. Coral reefs are home to 25 to 30 percent of all species in the ocean at some stage in their life cycles, which is incredible because they only cover less than 1 percent of the sea floor. Coral reefs are the most biologically diverse community of living beings on the planet. They can be home to thousands of different species, from small fish, crustaceans, and worms, to big creatures like sharks, sea turtles, stingrays. There's a wide range of different creatures who live on coral reefs. The coral itself is an amazing organism. Often when people look at a coral, they're not really sure whether it's a plant or an animal. Corals don't move much, they kind of look like plants, but the coral itself is actually an animal. Corals are animals who have a really unique symbiotic relationship with plants. They have tiny plants called zooxanthellae that live inside their tissue. And the plants are actually what give them their color. So when you look at a coral and you see a color, you're actually seeing the algae living inside the coral. The coral provides a home for the algae and it protects it because most species don't like eating coral. Corals can sting. And in exchange for this protection, the algae provides nutrients that the coral needs to survive. So they work together and as corals grow, they strive for sunlight so that the algae can photosynthesize better. Corals build skeletons out of calcium carbonate, and these skeletons create structures that are home to all sorts of different organisms. So now we have all these species living close together on the coral reef. They form intricate relationships with each other, and you get things like cleaning stations where pelagic species will come in to have their parasites removed, and it's all centered around the coral. So corals are really important to the health of the ocean, but healthy corals are becoming harder and harder to find. Around the world, corals are turning to rubble. 50% of the world's coral reefs are already gone, and scientists are predicting that all the world's coral reefs could be gone by the middle of the century. There are a lot of threats facing coral reefs, but the two biggest ones are coral bleaching and ocean acidification. Coral bleaching is caused by ocean warming. Corals have a specific temperature range that they can tolerate. And if the ocean temperature becomes too hot for too long, the coral gets stressed and it releases the symbiotic algae that live inside its tissue. Without the algae, corals turn white, revealing their skeletons. That's why it's called bleaching. If the temperature goes back to normal within a short period of time, the corals might be able to take back some algae and recover. But if the water is too hot for too long, then the coral simply can't survive. There were a couple mass bleaching events recently in Australia where about 95% of the northern reefs bleached and many didn't recover. Bleaching events are becoming more frequent and more severe, and this is a huge threat to coral reefs. But there's another problem facing corals called ocean acidification. Ocean acidification is the biggest issue on the planet right now. We all know about the impact that rising CO2 emissions are having on the atmosphere. But what a lot of people don't know is that much of the carbon we put up into the atmosphere doesn't stay in the atmosphere. It gets absorbed into the ocean, making the ocean more acidic. And in a more acidic environment, animals that build shells and skeletons can't form. Since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, humans have released one quadrillion pounds of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and the ocean has become 30% more acidic. The chemistry of the ocean is changing 10 times faster than it has at any other time in the last 50 million years. And if it continues to become more acidic, coral reefs could literally start dissolving. 
There's a place in Papua New Guinea where carbon dioxide is bubbling out of the sea floor from natural volcanic vents. And it's kind of like a time machine that allows us to look into the future and to see what the ocean could look like if ocean acidification continues. Corals can't survive in this more acidic water. They're dissolving and turning to rubble, and there aren't any fish living on them. This is the underwater world we could be heading toward if ocean acidification continues. And the effects of ocean acidification go far beyond coral reefs. Ocean acidification affects fish and their ability to smell and their ability to build skeletons. It affects shelled organisms, and it also affects plankton. Plankton form the base of the oceanic food web, and they produce the oxygen in two out of every three breaths we take. So ocean acidification affects all life on the planet. It's been attributed to at least four of the five mass extinctions the planet's had. Mass extinctions are events that wipe out 50 to 90 percent of life on the planet. We call them events, but mass extinctions usually take thousands or even millions of years to occur. Right now, we're bringing on a mass extinction in the ocean faster than in any extinction of the past. So we're in a lot of trouble, and we have a decision to make. You know, are we going to let the world we depend on be destroyed, or are we going to do something? The thing that makes this extinction different from the past ones is that it's being caused by a single species. It's being caused by human civilization. So we have the opportunity to turn things around. We know exactly what we need to do to save coral reefs and to avert this catastrophe. Something that's important to understand is that there's a lag time with ocean acidification. So if we stopped burning fossil fuels today, ocean acidification would probably continue for another 20 or 30 years because there's so much carbon in the atmosphere already and it takes time to get absorbed into the ocean. So part of our task is not just to stop burning fossil fuels, but also to sequester carbon out of the atmosphere before it goes into the ocean. We know we've cut down 75% of the forests on land. 90% of the fish are gone from the ocean. If we let that life come back, we could sequester an enormous amount of carbon, and we could stave off the worst effects of ocean acidification. So I think the task for young people right now is to create a world that works for all species, to stop the destruction and to bring life back to this planet. You know, imagine if we had 100% of the fish in the oceans instead of 90% of them being gone. What if we had 100% forest cover instead of 75% deforestation? We need to imagine that world and then do everything in our power to make it happen. Because everything we love and everything we depend on is in jeopardy and in danger of being wiped out within our lifetimes. So I think our task is to rise to the challenge and to force the kind of change we want to see in the world. Because there's a lot of interest invested in maintaining the status quo. And I've been to enough climate summits and ocean conferences that I'm pretty convinced governments aren't going to do the right thing unless we force them to or bypass that system altogether. When I give presentations about this and when I screen my movie, people often ask me if I have hope. And the answer I give is always, no, I don't have hope. Hope is a longing for future conditions over which we have no control. But the future of the ocean is completely within our control. So instead, I have agency. Because the ocean doesn't need people who hope for change right now. It needs people who fight for it. We're in a crazy predicament, and it's going to take radical action if we're going to turn things around. But I think we can do it. I think what the ocean needs right now is heroes. So I hope you'll join me in the battle to save life on Earth and create a future where corals can thrive. Thank you. Amazing, Julia. How to cut um, off the screen. Oh, there we go. <laughs> there she is. Awesome. Awesome, such a great talk and a really good message. I think you left it with, um, especially for all the classrooms that we have joining us today. I think it's really important for um, younger generation to realize that the power is in our hands and we can make a difference. And it doesn't matter how small we start, at least we're moving towards progress in the end. Awesome. awesome. Uh, so I will start with questions. Are you good to take questions? Do you have anything yeah, else you'd sure. like to add? Okay, I'm good. all right. So we had one class who joined us late. It's Mr. McCarthy's class. They're coming from British Columbia right now. Hello, guys. Um, 
Hey everybody, if you guys want to have the floor, um, you can ask a question now if you'd like. Who has a question, guys? Julia, um, can I ask the first question? Uh, first of all, thanks very much for that uh, very powerful, inspiring, and uh, awareness increasing uh, narrative there. Uh, can I ask a question? What would be the main uh, channel that you would suggest for uh, high school students, senior high school students, uh, in terms of becoming the youth environmental? Uh, warriors and, and heroes that uh, we need to be in order to save the oceans. Yeah, I mean, I think as high school students, you guys have just as much power as anything, anybody else. So the biggest thing I would encourage is to realize you have an enormous amount of power and to just, you know, do the biggest thing you can think of and to start right away because the problem is so urgent and we really can't afford to wait. Um, I think it's really important to get involved in activism, get involved in whatever it is you're passionate about. You know, every skill that we have can be applied to solving these problems. So if there's something you're good at, if it's art, music, writing, um, organizing, really anything, um, you can use it in service of the planet. And so I would just encourage you to follow your passion and what you're good at and combine those with a life that is full of meaning and adventure and do something awesome. Thank you. That's great, great advice. There actually is still on the ocean on Vancouver Island, uh, so we kind of feel a bit of a connection to that message. That uh, because we see them every day, and uh, we feel that we've got uh, some some special stewardship and responsibilities for that. Awesome. Okay. Great conversation started there. Um, on to Miss Simon's classroom. We actually have not met them yet. I had skipped over them in the introduction. So hello, guys. She has a groups of seven and eights joining us. Hi. Okay, we do. Does have, anybody have? Any? We do have a question for you from Adam. Mm -hmm. How long do we have to save the coral reefs? How long do we have to save the coral reefs? This is a really good question. Um, we're almost at a point right now, you know, probably 30 years ago would have been the ideal time to save coral reefs. So we're kind of in like over time right now, like everything we're going to do to try and save coral reefs right now, we kind of have to backpedal. We have to not only stop emissions, we have to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. We're really like in too far already and we've got to pull ourselves out of this hole. Things are really bad. It's really too late to be starting action, but the biggest thing we can do is, is just to start right away. Because um, every day we can do it sooner, it's going to be that much easier for us. Thank you. And is there anything that we can do from the Great Lakes region to help promote saving the coral reefs? Yeah, definitely. Um, do the biggest thing you can think of. You know, if you want, um, you can always screen the movie Sea of Life. I'm happy to help make that happen. Um, so if you want to raise awareness about what's happening in the ocean, but do so in any way you can imagine, you know, put up posters, um, do presentations, do whatever you can imagine. And yeah, whatever you think is going to have the biggest impact. Great, thank you. Okay, we're moving on to Miss Hans's class coming from Texas. She has a group of grade sevens. You guys have the floor if you'd like to ask a question. She's coming, hold on. How are you doing? How are you doing? All right, Jensen, we can see your pretty face. All right, talk right here. How hard was it to start this program? How hard was it to start this project, um, making the movie? It was the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, but when I started, I really had no idea how hard it was going to be or how long it was going to take. Um, I started making this movie and I kind of had this plan that I was going to get it done in less than a month. And then it ended up becoming much bigger and ended up taking three years and taking me to seven different countries on this kind of crazy quest around the world to figure out how we're going to save coral reefs. But it was, you know, every trip was supposed to be like the last trip. <laughs> and every interview was supposed to be like, okay, I just need to get this one more thing done and then it'll be finished. So it, things just kind of gradually built upon each other and then it became this massive project. Um, and it was a lot of work, but it was also the most amazing and exciting thing I've ever done. Thank you. 
it's a lot of fun fighting for the world we depend on. It's definitely um, an exciting thing to do. Great question. Um, okay, so then we have, let's go to Miss Lackey's class, her group of grade fives from New Jersey. If you guys want to ask a question, you have the floor. Um, what can we do in our day-to-day -day lives, not just to help the coral reef, but also to help the world? Great question. Um, there's definitely a lot of things you can do in your daily lives, and you'll often hear this message from environmental groups to, like, you know, turn off your light bulbs and do these little things in your life, and those things are all good, and, and we should do all these little things to reduce our impact wherever we have the chance, but I think the scale of the problem is so massive right now that we need to think bigger than just what we do in our individual lives, you know, as individuals, we have the ability to influence the world around us, we have the ability to have a much bigger impact than just what we we do in our lives so you know start with your life but talk to people about what's going on and you know join up with other people work together be more than an individual you know work in a group and do something bigger um because i think you know personal lifestyle changes at this point really aren't going to cut it if we're going to save coral reefs it's got to be bigger than that amazing message thanks for that question um, okay, let's move to Ms. Co Ms. Coe's classroom, her group of grade six from Waterloo. Um, let me just make sure you guys are unmuted. Here you are. You guys have a question? You have the floor. Hello, um, my name is Brooke and we're in grade six and um, we're from Sand Hills. And our question is, have you ever seen, um, have you seen a positive impact in the marine diversity ever since your film was released? Um, have I seen a positive impact since my film was released? It's kind of not been that much time since my film was released. I mean, it's been out for about two years. The first year was just doing festivals, and since then it's had a bit of a wider release. But um, in terms of what's happening in the ocean, everything's getting worse. It's not getting better. You know, it hasn't turned around that quickly. But I've definitely seen a positive impact in terms of seeing people react to the movie. You know, every time I screen the movie, people come up to me after and they'll tell me that, you know, it's changed their life in some way, whether it's a small thing that they're going to change in their life or a couple of people have actually told me they're going to dedicate their lives to saving the ocean. And they had nothing to do with conservation before that. So that's amazing to see it inspiring people and, you know, inspiring people to do something is really cool to see. Um, but in terms of what's actually happening in the ocean, everything is getting worse. It's not getting better at this point. Okay. And we will go to Miss, Miss, here we are, Miss Vanderzee's class, if you guys want to ask a question. Uh, I believe the mic is muted on your end. So if you want to unmute the mic and you'll have the floor. Perfect. Can you hear us? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. There's two, Tucker and um, Lexi have the first questions. Okay, we can go through there another turn. Um, where in the world is the most damage? Where in the world is the most damage? Okay. Um, I don't know. I'm going to say the Caribbean is probably the most damaged when it comes to coral reefs um, because I know that corals in that area have been depleted by 90%, whereas on a global scale, it's only at 50%. So that's a pretty big difference. 90% of the corals in the Caribbean have been wiped out. Um, in the Galapagos, actually, all the corals were wiped out. So that might be the place that's the most damaged. Um, but they kind of got wiped out by this. I think it was a disease that went through there. Um, many years ago um and the corals have been wiped out and they haven't come back but yeah next question uh yes what area has the most living coral was what area has the most, most living coral good no question way. yeah was there more no okay so the area that has the most living coral is probably the coral triangle so it's an area around indonesia papua new guinea that kind of area and in a lot of the extinctions of the past where corals have been wiped out the coral triangle is kind of this little area where corals tend to you know hang on it's like a refuge for corals and it's also the place with the most diversity of corals and the best most healthy corals today so that's the place that's going to be the most resilient 
Um, it's still threatened, but as of now, it's probably the place that has the healthiest corals. And I think there's one more so, question over here. Mm -hmm. um, we do have one more. What equipment do you use when you go underwater to find coral reefs? Please. Good question. What equipment do I use? Um, so I don't use equipment specifically to find coral reefs. I mean, we know where the coral reefs are and we go out to them. But the equipment that I use when I'm underwater, uh, I've got an underwater housing that I put my uh, video camera inside. That's what I use to film everything. And I use scuba equipment. So I've got a dive tank on my back and a regulator in my mouth so that I can breathe uh, while I'm underwater. Um, so that would be the equipment that I use. Thank you. Yeah. Great, thanks, Ms. Vanderskew class. Um, we're just gonna skip to one more classroom to ask a question, make sure we get to everybody, but we're running well on time, so um, we can come back to you guys, all right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me just mute. If you guys could mute your mic on your end, I think you might be using an iPad and I don't have control on this side. Um, so we'll move to Ms. Michael's class, her grade four is from Illinois. If you guys want to have uh, the floor to ask a question, you're free to do so. Thank you. I've got a few questions here. I step back for a second. And I just want to let you know that these guys gave up lunch and recess for this. So uh -huh. they're really excited. Will, come on up. Uh, go down so they can see your face. There you go. How long can coral live? How long can coral live? That's an awesome question. Corals are actually a really long-lived animal. So some corals can actually live for thousands of years, and they can take thousands of years to grow and to reach the size that they end up being. So they can live a really long time, hundreds or even thousands of years. Thank you. Colin had one, too. Come on, Colin. Um, does planting a tree help? Does planting a tree help? Uh, yeah, definitely. The more trees we can get in our world, the better. And also... Uh, just maintaining the forest that we have right now, you know, because an old living forest sequesters a lot more carbon than a new young forest. So we've got to protect what we have and definitely plant plant trees, plant as many trees as you can. <laughs> okay, like Micah's our last one. Okay, um, you know, um, how many, do you know how many um, corals are living in the Barbuda Triangle? Do I know how many? No, I don't. <laughs> a lot? Maybe a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that little unexplored area. <laughs> um, so we're doing well on time. Are you okay to stick around for maybe another 10 more minutes? Um, okay, awesome. So we will go back to Mr. McCarthy's class. If you guys have another question from the cusp of the ocean in BC, you guys have a floor. Right, Hi. Right, no. Hi. 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 Anytime you go diving on a coral reef, going with a fairly good, reputable operation, they will tell you, like, make sure you don't touch the reef, make sure you keep a good distance from it. Because corals are really sensitive, so if any kind of tourists um, touch it or kick it with their fins, that can cause huge damage to the coral. So, yeah, the restrictions for reefs would be advising people not to get too close, not to touch them and interact with them in that way. And also um, telling people not to use sunscreen in certain parts. I think in Hawaii they ban people from using certain types of sunscreen because the sunscreens actually have a huge negative effect on coral reefs, um, which people kind of just recently found out. So that's a big thing as well. So good little known fact. Um, thank you, Mr. McCarthy's class. We will now head to Ms. Hans's class, who grade sevens in Texas. If you guys want to ask another question, you are free to do so. Awesome. Thank you. Hi. Hi. How did you get funding to travel to all those places? Good question. How did I have funding to travel all these places? 
Um, it was entirely self-funded. So I started when I was 16. And at the time, I was planning previously on going to university or college or something. So I had a little bit of money set aside for that. I took that out, used it to buy cameras and plane tickets and set off on this journey. Uh, but it ended up requiring a bit more money than that. So that was just getting into debt, basically. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's always going to start somewhere, though. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we will head to Miss Lackey's class. If you guys have a last question to ask, you have the floor. Um, can you like um make your own coral or like grow it, like um in a laboratory? In a laboratory, and then like release it to the ocean. Yeah, people do grow corals in laboratories and release them to the ocean. And I talked to a couple scientists who were actually studying that um, while I was making the movie. And they're trying to figure out ways of like growing coral up in a lab to a pretty good size and then actually planting it out in the ocean. Um, and they think it might be able to help it be a bit more resilient. Um, but it definitely can't really counteract against ocean acidification because ocean acidification just erodes at the coral skeleton. But in terms of helping it with warming, they've definitely found some ways to, to help corals be a bit more resilient to warming, which is really cool um, that they're able to do that. But at the same time, you know, oceans, I mean, corals cover a pretty big area of the ocean. It's not exactly like we can just go out and, you know, replant entire coral reefs and they're they've got so many different species of coral that make up the reef and it's just a few species that they've been studying and trying to make more resilient so it's kind of it's interesting to see what they're doing there and it's might might be a helpful stopgap measure but we really got to get things under control with um, co2 emissions and things like that thank you Ms. Thank you. Lucas. okay so we will head to Ms. Coe's class. If you guys want to ask another question, you have the floor. Um, well, we don't have another question. Oh, OK, perfect. Thanks for joining. Anyways, we will now go to Ms. Vanderzee's class. If you guys have another question, you're free to do so. Yes, we have another question, Jagger. So we live in Idaho, and we have our oceans here. So our would protecting land animals help? And if not, what else can we do? That's a really good question. Can protecting land animals help? Actually, it can. Um, protecting and restoring ecosystems on land definitely helps with the ocean because the more biomass we can have on land, the more carbon we can pull out of the atmosphere. You know, having a healthy ecosystem anywhere on the planet is going to have benefits for the ocean, for sure. So, yeah, anything you can do locally can definitely help with the ocean. And, I mean, you can also think in terms of what you can do to help the ocean. Because, you know, no matter where we live on the planet, we are so connected to the ocean. You know, every two breaths we take, one of them comes from the ocean. Um, and everything you do eventually reaches the ocean. I mean, anything that goes down the drain where you are might eventually end up in the ocean. So we're interacting in ways that we don't necessarily even think about. Um, even things like animal agriculture, um, something like 30% of the fish that are pulled out of the ocean every year are actually being eaten by like pigs, cows, chickens, farmed fish. Uh, even though we might not think we're interacting, we're actually pulling life out of the world, having all these crazy things that happen. So it's very interesting to start seeing the way there are connections, even where you might not realize it. Thank you. Yeah, great question. It's nice to see places where you may not be touched by the ocean or experience the ocean too much, but everything that you do. Um, it's all connected when it comes down to it. We're all just one big ecosystem. So that uh, was a really good question to raise up. So let's hit to Miss Michael's class. We'll go to Illinois if you guys want to ask another question and then we can finish things up here. Um, let me just unmute your mic or you guys might have to unmute your mic. I think we're on. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. You're all good. Okay. Okay. We've got a few. So whatever you can take. Kate, come on up. I have a question. How does coral form? 
how does coral form? It's a really good question. Um, so coral starts its life with a really amazing spawning process. So the corals will release little tiny eggs and sperm up into the water. And these eggs, they float up and they kind of, you know, meet each other at the surface of the water. They float around and they join together and then they'll kind of settle in and find somewhere on the ocean floor that's suitable for them to live. So very few of these eggs will actually end up spawning into a coral, but that's how their process starts. So a few of them might find a good place, um, they'll start growing there, and the corals are actually made up of colonies of polyps. So it starts with one little polyp and then they form these larger colonies as they grow. And so a polyp is a little, or a little individual organism of the coral and it, you know, splits and becomes multiples and then it grows bigger and bigger. Okay. Can you take one more? Mm -hmm. Or are we out? Okay, let's see. Micah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, um, so how many seas have you been in with coral and stuff? How many places? How many seas have I been in with coral? Um, I was in the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the ocean around Australia. Those were the places I was where coral was. Wow, you've been, a, you've been a, to a lot of places. <laughs> okay. So, awesome. We could keep going forever, so just. Uh, okay. Have a bunch um, <laughs> that's fine. Thank you. Good questions coming from your classroom there. Um, I have one question. If you had a, like your favorite place that you've been to, and why was it your favorite? Um, my favorite place was probably Cabo Pulmo in Mexico. Um, it's a place that was, it used to be a fishing village like 20 years ago, but they had so heavily overfished the area that there was almost nothing left in the ocean. So the people created a marine protected area. They banned fishing and within 10 years of doing so, the biomass, the amount of life in the ocean increased by over 450%. So I, w I ended up going there 20 years after this marine protected area had been created and the ocean was teeming with life. It was one of the most abundant, beautiful places I had ever seen underwater. So that was really cool. Wow, what was it just outside of Mexico you said? Yeah, it's on the west side of Mexico, basically in the um, parks. Yeah. West side of Mexico, awesome. Well, thank you for joining us, everybody. Thanks for your talk, Julia. It was amazing to hear um, your passion project that turned in, that was like kind of a domino effect from one documentary that led to you um, on your own journey of, you know, seeing something that's a problem in the world and dedicating everything you can to uh, try to raise more awareness to it. And I think you left a really good message to the students about, you know, um, finding out what you're passionate about and then finding a way to apply it and to connect with people and to communicate it and just to bring awareness to it. Um, so thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. And uh, this is a big thank you. What we'll do. Yeah. 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 One big thank you to Julia thank you. and all the effort she's put in to try to make this world a better place. We really appreciate it. The world needs more people like you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah.